From childhood, we're taught that to be moral is to be altruistic. We hear that acting to benefit someone else is praiseworthy, but acting to benefit yourself is not. But what if that's all wrong? What if that idea is completely wrong? In his new book, The Tyranny of Need, Peter Schwartz challenges the conventional view of morality and presents the moral alternative of a rational, non-predatory self-interest. Welcome to New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Elon Jerno, and I'm pleased today to have with us Peter Schwartz to talk about his new book. Welcome to the podcast, Peter. Thank you, Elon. I should say welcome back because you've had we've had you before. Just a quick word about Peter's background. You can find out more about him at his website, peterschwartz.com. But I'll, uh, I should mention Peter is a retired chairman of the board of directors of, of the Ayn Rand Institute and has had a long association with the Institute, and he is also a distinguished fellow associated with the Institute. So we're really glad to have you. I want to dive right into your book and talk a bit about what, what you're arguing and what I think um, – people will find really novel and, and, and illuminating. I want to start with one observation about the title, because I know uh, I think anyone seeing this will ask themselves, tyranny, that's a really strong word. Uh, you're suggesting that there's something cruel, oppressive, destructive, unjust in a deep way going on here. And in a, reading the book, you know, one of the chapters talks about the shackles of altruism. And I think a lot of people will find this powerful imagery really arresting. So I wanted to start with just the observation. You're going out against conventional morality. And before we get to why you think it's so bad, maybe you can tell us what is it exactly? What is, what is the morality that you're identifying and targeting for criticism? Yes, I, I think it's a morality that, that I think is, is terribly unjust. And what I mean by the tyranny of need is the idea that someone who has less than you has a claim against you, a moral claim against you. That is that you have a duty to provide for the needs of someone simply because he has less and you have more. Now you may have worked hard to earn your money. You've come by it honestly. You deserve all the wealth that you have. But if there's someone who lacks it for whatever reason, if he lacks it and needs it, and you're able to satisfy that need, according to the doctrine of altruism, you are morally obligated. You have a duty to sacrifice your needs and your desires for the sake of someone in need. And I think that's terribly unjust. That is, is a, a gross injustice against you and t it's telling you that your life is to be subordinated to someone else your neighbor's life is more important if he has some needs that you can fulfill you are in other words you exist in order to serve someone else and that i think is is terribly wrong because properly you should exist it's your life you should exist to further your own uh, needs and your own desires. You should exist to pursue your own happiness in a principled, productive way, rather than feel a duty to sacrifice your, your wealth, your needs, your happiness for the sake of someone else. So let me ask you a bit about that. So I think a lot of people's reaction might be, well, Altruism really just is not asking that much of you. It's drop a few dollars in the collection box, donate a few cans of soup to the homeless shelter, give away some clothes to Goodwill so that they can pass it along and, and pay it forward. Is it really, I mean, the way people experience it and the way you're describing it, there seems to be a gulf here. How do you account for that? Yes, people have the idea, which is a mistaken idea, that altruism is simply a call for benevolence. Act gener generously towards people who are in need through no fault of their own, if you can afford it. Respect their rights. Help a blind man cross the street if you can. This is what they think altruism is 
explicitly, but if you think of it, it's, it's much more than that. Altruism is not simply the idea that you should help out somebody who's maybe your neighbor whose house is flooded and he is in need, has no, no money or clothes, and you help him out temporarily if you can afford it. That's fine. That's perfectly compatible with a philosophy of self-interest. But what altruism means is that you help someone even if you cannot afford it. What altruism says is not that you be generous towards somebody and that that person then thank you for your benevolence and your generosity, but that you are he is owed your help. You have an obligation to sacrifice your needs for the sake of his needs. He doesn't have to thank you for it because he has a claim to it. If you repay somebody that you borrowed money from, he doesn't have to thank you. It's his. You've taken it from him. Now you're giving it back. That's what altruism regards you. When you are to be a servant to others, it means everything you have, all your wealth, your talents, your energy, all of that is not rightfully yours. It should not be used to benefit your own life. That's selfish. Rather, according to altruism, it should be used to benefit anyone who lacks what you have. Anyone in need has a claim, a moral claim against you for whatever you have that is able to satisfy his needs. That what that is what altruism is. And if you look at it properly, what it means is that altruism demands that you be a servant to others. That person in need is your master because he can tell you, I need X, Y, Z, and you can provide it. And you are a servant who has to comply. And if you don't, you are being selfish and immoral. And you're going to feel guilty throughout your life, whether you, in any case, actually sacrifice for a person in need, whether you give money to the homeless guy on the corner or not, you will feel guilty. Even if you don't give it, you'll feel guilty because you, you believe you should have given it. It's a very destructive doctrine. And the, the, the proper approach is the exact opposite, which uh, also requires a lot of uh, demythologizing some uh, misconceptions that people have. Yeah, I want to come back to the alternative because I, th I think that's part of what's so illuminating in your book. I want to pause on an example that you included in the book that I thought it just it was horrifying in many ways. But let me just re re summarize it for you in the audience who haven't uh, read it. You describe the parents of a 20-year-old woman who was raped and murdered and then their reaction to the, the perpetrator and their approach to him. And I mean, maybe you can summarize it better than I can, but they, their attitude was very forgiving and they saw the, the potential in this individual. And I think a lot of people reading that would say, whatever it is these people are doing, I don't know that I could react that way. That's certainly not what I think. And they might even ask themselves, is this really, are these outliers or are they really being, are they freaks of, in some way, or is this really what altruism looks like? Because they seem much more like saints, and who who among us could really behave that way? So just maybe you can help us understand what you, you see in this example, and are they really outliers, or is this what is called for here? Well, this is, this is a good illustration of what happens when people genuinely accept altruism. Now, it's true that most people do not accept, do not practice altruism consistently. In fact, no one can practice it consistently and remain alive. If you practice it, you really accepted it consistently, you'd have to give up your life for someone who maybe needs it more. I give the example in the book of, of somebody who gave a kidney to a stranger because the stranger needed it more than he did, more than his family and his children might uh, need it, and then was pondering whether he should give a se his second kidney, whether he should give his other organs, whether he should give uh, his heart, his eyes, his liver. Whatever it is that people need, this person felt guilty 
for not doing it. Now, again, I stress that no one can practice altruism consistently and remain alive. So people feel guilty all the time. But that exactly is the problem. They feel guilty. They feel constrained. They are not willing and able to fully live their lives, to pursue their happiness, because they, they have the shackles of altruism holding them back. Like look at someone like Bill Gates, for example. Here was a guy, here's a guy who, whose company developed products that enormously changed people's lives across the world. It made things so much easier, uh, word processing and spreadsheets and so forth. Everything that uh, beforehand took a lot of time and effort now is made easy and, and virtually everybody uses it. So he's made a tremendous advance in the living standards of people across the globe. But what is he praised for? Is, does that give him moral praise? No. He is praised for his philanthropy. He's got foundation, gives money away. It's giving his money away that earns him the, uh, the title of a moral person, according to altruism, whereas the things that in fact have changed and, and helped people's lives tremendously are dismissed as crass materialism, crass commercialism. Now this, the example you gave earlier of the parents whose daughter was tragically raped and murdered and <clears throat> excuse me at the trial the judge called this the killer one of the most savage people he had ever come across the parents were willing to forgive him the parents were willing to sacrifice their precious value their daughter whom they had loved and say well okay we forgive you we're going to pretend you're a good person and we're going to um, uh, do away with our desire for justice and instead act towards you with anti-justice with mercy which is what altruism demands this is the perfect uh exemplification of the Christian doctrine of turn the other cheek. Christianity is the philosophy, the religion, most directly responsible for spreading and inculcating the doctrine, the ethics of self-sacrifice. In the Christian religion, the ideal is the ideal man is Jesus Christ. Why is he the ideal person? Because he was without sin and he had to sacrifice his actual life for whose sake for the sake of people who were sinners so the good is sacrificed for the evil that is the essence of what altruism demands it's not simply love thy neighbor which is enough of a sacrifice but it's love thy enemy love people who want to harm you Love people who hate you. Don't think of yourself. That's selfish. Abandon yourself. The self. Be humble. Devote yourself to making a zero out of your life and giving it away to those, and to particularly to those who don't deserve it. The more they don't deserve it, the greater is your sacrifice, and the greater your sacrifice the more virtuous you are, according to altruism. Let me ask you about sacrifice, because that's come up a number of times. In the examples of being somebody who's undeserving and so forth, but there, aren't there cases where when people think about the, going to college, going to law school, becoming a doctor, there's a lot of sacrifices involved uh, as people think of it. So it takes so many years and you have to forego opportunities for socializing because you're busy studying you have to forego vacation sometimes. So all of those things people think of as they're sacrifices, but it's not, there's no one on the other end of it who's unworthy. It's I'm doing it for my, I mean, this is the kind of life I want. So do you think of that as the same kind of sacrifice? 
I've lost, I've lost the sound. Can you, I've lost the end of your question. Yeah, I was just asking if you think of it as the yes, same I kind of sacrifice. Yes. Okay, I, I, I think I get, I think I get the gist of it. It's a good question. I'm glad you raised that because it, it represents a really tragic mistake that many people make. What does a sacrifice mean? A sacrifice means you give up something. You give up something, not in return for something that's a greater value, but you give up something of value to you, something that's good for you, for something that is not good for you. You give up a value for something that is not a value. Now, if I go to the store and buy a loaf of bread for a couple of dollars, I'm giving up my money, but that's not a sacrifice. It's a trade. It's an exchange. It's I'm giving up something that I value less for the sake of something I value more. The $2 is worth less to me than the loaf of bread, so I make an exchange. And conversely, the grocer to him, he's giving away his bread and he's getting my $2 and he's making a profitable exchange. Neither one of us is sacrificing. A sacrifice means you're giving away something that is a value to you for the sake of something that is not a value to you. So if you are a student, let's say, uh, and you're working hard, you, give, you gave the example, you're studying to be a, a doctor, you are making a long-term investment in the same way that if you put money in some investment or in the bank or, or elsewhere, and you do it in order to get a, an interest, a, re, a rate of return, at some point in the future, that is a profit making transaction. It is a sacrifice is if you give away your money and don't get anything for it. If you give your money to some homeless guy on the street, whom you know, will use the money to buy his next fix, or his next bottle of a bourbon. Uh, that is a sacrifice that is giving your your earned your hard earned money away to someone who does not deserve it, but simply because he needs it. Someone who is not simply out of, uh, in, in, mis, in some misfortune, but someone who is the cause of his misfortune. That is what altruism demands. And that is what sacrifice means. So you should never call a, a transaction you're engaged in for the sake of benefiting yourself, never call that a sacrifice. It's a trade. Just that when you're playing chess, you may give up a pawn or a rook in order to capture your opponent's bishop uh, or, or queen. Now, the, the pawn is worth less to you than capturing his bishop. It's not a sacrifice. It's a temporary foregoing of some gain for the purpose of obtaining a greater gain in the future. So that is the, 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 the crucial distinction between sacrifice and a profit-seeking transaction. So before we go to the other topic, which I want to get to, the demythologizing of the alternative, it sounds, just to sum up some of the threads that have come up, it sounds like the the conventional view of morality leads people to it it tells them to pursue actions that they can't really live up to so it's it's an ideal that is if not impossible then very very hard to live up to and tell me if you agree with that and then it it undermines their sense of self confidence it, it causes guilt i mean do you agree with that summary Yes, that is that is the nature of the shackles of altruism. It, it, it binds you. It restricts you. It makes you feel guilty for living your life. Every dollar you earn, every new car you buy, every restaurant meal you, you indulge in that you pay for with your money that you've, you've honestly earned, all of that is actually a source of guilt when you stop to think, are there people who don't have a car? 
Are there people who don't have six suits of clothing as I do? Are there people who can't come to this restaurant because it's too expensive? And if so, are you morally obligated to give up your desires, give up your uh, pleasure for the sake of someone who lacks it, who needs it, whose needs you're able to fulfill? There is an, an altruism answers yes. There is no way around the fact that if you accept altruism, every pleasure you engage in is tarnished and is a, an inducer of guilt because someone somewhere is not able to enjoy the same pleasure and you have the capacity of sacrificing so that he, that person can experience that pleasure. It's a terrible noose around people's necks. It prevents them from living a genuinely fulfilling, satisfying, happy life. So you, uh, the book's really powerful in presenting evidence for this view that altruism is so destructive. I, I think a natural reaction people will have to he hearing that is, yes, okay, this is really harmful. I can see that. But where do we go from here? Are you saying that we just give up on morality? And it, it, one of the points you make that I thought was worth just underlining here is there is this equation of being moral with being altruistic and that it's a very narrow conception. I mean, is that right? Yes, that, that's part of the injustice of the uh, the whole code of altruism, the, the, uh, all of the, what all of the advocates of altruism are trying to inculcate is not simply that altruism is the right way to engage in moral behavior, but that it's the equivalent of moral behavior. There's, it's inconceivable to them that there's an alternative because the only alternative that people are taught is possible is a straw man, a straw man concocted by the preachers of altruism. The straw man is what they call selfishness. What do they mean by selfishness? They mean somebody like a con man like Bernie Madoff or a, a, a brutal killer and pillager like Attila the Hun who goes around lying, stealing, cheating, murdering, other people in order to satisfy his desires. And they say, well, if the alternative is being Attila the Hun or a Mother Teresa, the Mother Teresa is the moral alternative. And that is a terribly, terribly false alternative. The proper alternative to altruism, the proper alternative to sacrificing yourself for others is not sacrificing anybody, neither others to yourself nor yourself to others, but rather living your life by your own effort, by your own productive work. The honest businessman who makes a fortune by producing something new no one has ever seen before. He is rich not by exploiting anybody. His wealth is not taken from someone who is, ha, doesn't have it. His wealth is created. It didn't exist before. Any value that you obtain, if you do it honestly, you do it by your own efforts, is something that did not exist before and is not taken from somebody. Whatever the level of your activity is, whether it's a, a student studying for a test, studying to get good grades, and in, he has the alternative of going to, before some important test, instead of studying, he has the option of going out and partying with his fraternity brothers who are urging him to come they need him there. They need him to, to fill out the, the uh, um, people who are uh, invited to some uh, uh, big party. 
he has the choice. <clears throat> Do I want to stay here and study and pursue what is a value to me of getting good grades and so forth? Or do I want to give that up <clears throat> and go along with the demands of my fellow students who somehow need me to, as a presence at their party? The true selfish person uh, lives by moral principles. He lives by principles of honesty, of justice, of integrity, because he realizes that those virtues are in his long-term interest. He understands he may gain a value for the moment by being dishonest, by stealing his neighbor's car or robbing a bank, but he understands that in the long run, this is against his interest. In the long run, he understands that his interests lie fundamentally in living in accord with reality and not trying to fake it and not trying to distort things and not trying to pretend that someone else's money actually belongs to him because he knows that his self-interest requires the principle that everybody's property is his own. He benefits by having an exclusive right to his property and using it to further his life, and therefore he recognizes the same right that his neighbor has. The truly selfish person does not live as a parasite. He wants to live by his own effort. It's the selfless person, the unselfish person, who tries to grab on some other person and live off of his energy and off of his production by lying and cheating. Selfishness requires each individual to live his own life by his own efforts through the rational exercise of his own mind. So what I'm hearing is that someone like Bernie Madoff, who had this massive billion dollar Ponzi scheme, who was convicted of various kinds of fraud, that, kind, that is not a self-interested path. That's not a selfish path, according to what you're saying. But let me let me challenge us a bit from what I think some people might hear this for the first time might might say to you. Uh, why? Well, isn't selfishness? Why do we even need advice on how to be selfish? Isn't it the easiest thing in the world? We just flop on the sofa, aim the remote control at the TV, and we know we got what we want. And we're selfish. We're all happy and. So that's one kind of challenge to you. And then the other kind of challenge is, but what about the perfect crime, right? So yeah, in the long run, if I get caught, this is a bad thing for me. I don't want to be in that position. But what if I can, what if I can perpetuate the perfect crime? It, it's a 10 minute thing. And then I've got the rest of my life. I don't have to worry about working. So maybe you could respond to those two. All right, let's take the one. The, the, the person who just uh, is a couch potato and lives his life that way, perhaps mooching off of his in-laws uh, and surviving by that method is acting self-destructively. He's not acting selfishly. He's destroying his life. He's making himself dependent upon the efforts of other people. If they withdraw those efforts, he is doomed. To be selfish is to be engaged in a rational process of living. The main vehicle by which you sustain your life is your mind, your rational mind. You benefit yourself by engaging your mind, by exercising your rational faculty, by thinking, by figuring out how can I make a living? How can I make a better living? How can I enjoy my life more? What books should I read? What do I need to know? All of that is directed towards the goal of advancing your life to the maximum extent possible. Mindlessness, the couch potato who just turns his mind off in effect and tries to live on, on automatic control is surrendering his life. He's giving up his life to the vagaries 
of whatever happens uh, uh, outside of his control. He can't, doesn't control anything. If, as I said, if, if the people he's mooching off decide to kick him out, he's finished. Uh, he doesn't know what's happening tomorrow. He doesn't know how to uh, establish a career for himself, doesn't know how to get a job. He does not know, it does not want to know how to find out the means by which a human being must sustain his own life. So that is directly self-destructive. Now, your second example, what about somebody who commits a so-called perfect crime? The reason that crime, and by crime I mean stealing, using force against an innocent victim, the reason crime is contrary to your interest is not simply the fact that maybe the police will catch you and put you in jail. That is, a, is an important part of it. But the, 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 the more fundamental reason is that the requirements of human life, as I said, are the exercise of your mind. We're not born with knowledge. We're not born with, quote, instincts, the way animals are. We have to figure out how to live. And if you just sit and turn your mind off, you can't exist. You're gone. Your life requires rational thinking. What does rational thinking mean? Rational thinking means you are committed to focusing on reality, to focusing on facts. You don't try to distort the facts. You don't try to evade the facts. You don't try to pretend that poison is food. You don't try to pretend that something is not what it is. Your life depends upon a total 100% commitment to recognizing and abiding by reality and not trying to evade or distort it. Now, the criminal is trying to do exactly that. He, is, he robs his neighbor, let's say. He's got the money. Now, his life is now set on a course where he's got to constantly distort reality. He's got to somehow pretend that the money he has came from some source other than his neighbor's uh, vault. He's got to pretend that um, he was uh, the, the evidence that there is that the, excuse me, the evidence that, that exists that he was in his neighbor's house at that time and maybe they'll they'll be the police can find evidence of that he has to come up with a phony existence a phony set a set of lies to explain all the actual ramifications of his decision to rob that person because in reality, every action has consequences. And every one of those consequences has consequences. So take the obvious example of somebody who's trying to cheat on his wife and thinks he can get away with it. He's got to keep coming up with lie after lie to protect his being discovered. Any criminal, Anybody who commits an irrational action not only has to hide from the police, which itself entails a whole series, a whole set of dishonest uh, activities, but he's got to hide the knowledge from friends. He can't have a friend find out that he stole the money. Can't have his wife find out that he stole the money. Every step that he takes, he's got to ask himself, is this going to somehow provide some clue, some evidence of what I did? He constantly has to put himself, not just his victims, but put himself in a reality so that he avoids or tries to avoid the consequences 
of the actions he took in reality. And that kind of pretense living, that kind of creation of a phony reality within which to exist is not in your interest. It only will keep undermining you and make you unable to pursue your own happiness and succeed. Whether the police ultimately find you out or not, you will not be able to be happy because you are at war with reality. So one observation that I want to bring in some questions from uh, our viewers already that are stacking up. So one observation in the book, you talk about this, that the, the foundation for the old moral alternative that you articulate is the philosophy of Ayn Rand, is objectivism. So, it's, it, the, so that's informing the whole analysis. Let me bring in a couple of uh, audience questions and comments. So one observation, um, I'll just read it out to you. Uh, JP Morgan, who heroically rescued the world economy more than tw once, is remembered as a, quote, robber baron. He's only admired for his art collection. Thank you for the super chat donations uh, behind that. So I, I, I'm taking that as an example of an injustice that comes from people's view that's colored by altruism. Let me put a couple of questions in front of you, Peter, and you can pick which one to start with. So uh, here's one. Uh, is need a legitimate input, just not a legitimate standard? For example, if someone's drowning or starving, their need should be taken into consideration, not mandated by the state. I'm not quite sure about the last part, but just to, maybe you can elaborate a bit about how you think about those kinds of scenarios and what need, if at all, as a factor. Yes, need can be a factor in decisions that you make, but the, the, the important point is exactly what you said. It is not the standard. What is the standard? The standard is your life, your interests, your needs. That is the standard by which you judge what actions to take. Now, if you encounter an emergency, as you described, you, you come across somebody drowning, and obviously he needs to be saved in order to stay alive. That is not the, the total of your consideration. That is not even the standard of your consideration. The standard remains the same, your life and the requirements of it. So if you can't swim, should you go in there and, and, and drown or risk drowning in order to save it? Or let's say you're, it, it's, it's in the ocean and it's very dangerous and it's a storm and this is a stranger, you don't know him. He's no, he's no real value to you. Should you jump in and face, you know, a 75% uh, risk of drowning yourself? No, the standard of anything you do remains your life and the requirements of, of, of living. In emergency situations, there's a different context. And again, if you can save somebody without drowning yourself, without risking drowning yourself, uh, and it's a temporary situation, you're not going around the world looking for people drowning so that you spend your life rescuing them. And then after you've rescued them, you know, take on the responsibility of, of their lives and have to put them through college and, and, and grad school. It's a temporary, unusual situation. In that case, you can take the effort of going there, trying to save him, whatever the, the situation is. But again, your life is still the most important value to you, not the other person's need. So we're getting a lot of questions. And thank you all for the super chat support. We'd love to uh, appreciate that. And we'd love to get through as many of these questions as we can. So I'll try to make them a bit quicker and you can tell me uh, your thoughts on these. Um, let's see. So, so this is more of a comment about a movie. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. It's called Regarding Henry. Uh, a law firm profits by lying to protect the hospital from being sued by a man who was harmed by their negligence. Only when one of the lawyers gets brain damaged does he help the man. One of 1,000 sources. I'm not, don't, I guess this might be a response to something you've said earlier about the, the uh, sort of short range perspective that some people have and that that's not really in their interest. I think that's what, is going on here, but let me, let me put a question to you. Um, here's a question. How can you prove conclusively that the single mom working at McDonald's has more self-esteem 
than the single mom on welfare staying home and playing with her kids all day. Well, and what, what does self-esteem mean? Self-esteem means having a confidence in your ability to live in reality, which means to be productive, to produce the values that your life requires. Basically, it means having confidence in your mind's ability to figure out what you need to do in order to live and to be happy. And the other part of self-esteem is self-respect, having a respect for the value that is yourself, the value that you've earned by exercising your rational faculty in pursuit of sustaining your life. So the person who does that, the first example of the, the clerk at the supermarket, whatever your abilities, you may have very modest abilities and not be able to do more than be a clerk. But even there, I, I, I really doubt that that's possible unless you're brain damaged. But whatever the extent of your talents are, you try to maximize them, you go as far as your abilities take you, and you then have respect for yourself because you know you've done whatever you can in order to sustain this precious value that's your life. Whereas the person on welfare knows that she's given up her life. She's, she's said, well, I'm not taking responsibility for it. I'm abdicating. I'm giving my life over to some other entity and living off their efforts, not my own efforts. And I'm going to survive by grace of their charity. Now, how much confidence can you have in your ability to live your life when you abdicated the responsibility for living it? You can't. How much respect can you have for yourself? How much can you esteem yourself for what you've done when you know you haven't done what your life objectively requires in order to sustain itself? You've given it away. So I don't think that there's much of a choice there's much of a problem in determining who has the greater self-esteem. So just one follow-up comment about the example I read to you from the, of, of the movie regarding Henry with the law firm. I, I think the, the point behind that uh, it was that in the eyes of the filmmakers, that law firm was, was seen as selfish. So that's sort of the caricature that you've been talking about, and this is a, a fictional example. I want to take a couple of questions about political cultural issues and, and just bring out the fact that the book is pretty broad ranging. You talk about a lot of different kinds of social and political examples and it's rich with examples So people want to really dive in and think through these issues in concrete details. There's a lot of examples here, a range of issues. So let's talk about one sort of political thing that comes out of this analysis. So the question here is, uh, why should I be concerned if there are many individuals in the world that believe in altruism? And the, the person goes on to suggest what the answer might be. Uh, the only reason to be concerned is if they get together and they use their the government as a as a as a tool to control your life. I mean, how do you think of that issue? Well, no, that the the harm that altruism does is not solely as being the foundation for statism, for a welfare state. That is terrible. That is, is a major element of the destructiveness of altruism. But altruism is an idea that, that people voluntarily accept and ask yourself, am I better off if the people next door or the people I associate with or the people in my city or my country are all rationally selfish people or do i do i not care well obviously you're going to benefit by having the ability to deal with and to interact with people who are themselves producing values that are going to potentially be valued to you or values you can trade with whether this is in the realm of businesses producing iPhones and computers and uh, spaceships to Mars, or it's in the realm of art, for example, 
So you want to have rational people producing rational works of art, paintings, sculptures, movies, plays. <coughs> Excuse me. Those are to your interest. It is in everybody's interest to have reason spread throughout the culture. The more rational people exist, the better off everybody is. So maybe we'll make this the last uh, question. And uh, before we, uh, before I put it on the table, I just want to mention a lot of things in the book that I want to draw people's attention to. Uh, and one of them, we, I don't know that we'll get into it here, but there's a really illuminating analysis of the this issue of the public interest and how that is informed by uh, the, the philosophy of altruism. So let me put this last question to you and uh, just get your thoughts on this. Uh, the questioner asks, and thanks for the support behind the question, uh, Peter, are you optimistic about the future of the world? And I guess given your analysis of the ideas going on right now, or is humanity still too primitive to embrace radical individualism and selfishness? Uh, and then the question goes on, uh, are gulags and concentration camps in our near future? So maybe you can unspool that for us. Well, let me take the middle part. It is not an issue of people being too primitive to understand this. They're, they're, they're certainly in the Western world, we've had the enlightenment. We still have the, the um, consequences of that. People are not, too primitive to understand and be able to choose to reject altruism and to embrace rational selfishness. As to what the future of the, the country or the world uh, poses, I don't have a firm view. I, I, ha I have this view. I have the view that, that they, they are simultaneously two tracks that are being pursued, each headed in opposite directions. So we've got the, the basic culture, which I think is getting worse. Uh, I think that the irrational ideas that are dominating the culture are becoming more dominant and becoming more destructive, whether it's things like uh, environmentalism or egalitarianism and diversity. That I think is pushing the culture in a very bad, destructive direction. And simultaneously, you've got the opposite. You've got the antidote, you've got objectivism, and which offers a solution and an alternative to that deadly trap. Objectivism is definitely farther along than it was 20, 30 years ago. There are more objectivists, there are more books, there are more articles, there are more people teaching the ideas of objectivism. And then it's a question of which will happen first. Will that first track simply, you know, run out of space and go off into the abyss uh, before there's time to correct the course? Or will there be enough time for objectivism to take hold and board that train and change its direction? I don't know. I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic, but I'm not incurably pessimistic either. It's simply a matter of time and we just have to see which will outlast which. Thank you. I, I want to encourage everyone to get a copy of Peter's book and, and read it if they're new and interested in these ideas. And if they know someone who is has these questions and would really benefit from hearing all the, the demythologizing of what altruism is and the demystification of what selfishness really is, the book is The Tyranny of Need, and you can get it now on Amazon. I highly encourage you to do that. If you want to learn more about Peter's work, you can go to his website, peterschwartz.com. He's also on Twitter, uh, at Peter Schwartz. Sorry, let me get this right. At P. Schwartz, I-D-S. You can find him there. And uh, thank you again for joining us today, Peter. I really uh, enjoy the conversation and wish you the best in getting the book out there and reaching more people. Thank you. I enjoyed this. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to let everyone know if you enjoyed listening to this conversation. We would love it if you uh, come back and be here next time. It's going to be February 2nd, which happens to be Ayn Rand's birthday. We're having a special episode where the focus will be powerful life lessons from Ayn Rand. We hope you can join us. 
is at a different time than usual at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. We would love for you to be there. Ankar Gate and Aaron Smith will be hosting that conversation. And for everyone watching today, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe, click the bell, get notifications. We'd love for you to uh, tell us what you think, leave comments. You can click the I like this button. It helps us get more attention for these, this content and reach more people. And the same is if, you, if you're watching on other social platforms, please like, share, comment. We'd love to hear from you. If you have other comments or suggestions, we can be reached newideal at einrand.org. We read everything. We sometimes are inspired by the questions to put on different conversations and, and different topics. And we will be having a Q&A uh, podcast coming up later this month. So if you have questions about objectivism, you're welcome to send them to us at that email address. Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you next time.